one beautiful thing about martial arts is that people can find the art that works for them. Hey everybody, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 434. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Ms. Susan Spahn. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a guy who loves martial arts in pretty much every way you could imagine someone saying that. I love the history, I love the training, I love the camaraderie, and I love how all of those things have allowed me to come to you in your ears for this episode. And for any of the other episodes we have, we've got 433 more. You can check them out at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You'll find transcripts and photos, links, a whole bunch more. If you go to whistlekick.com, you're going to see everything that we're involved in because we do a lot more than this podcast, including our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you'll save 15% off anything that we have over there, from apparel to uniforms to protective equipment, books. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Check it out and show your support for Whistlekick. And of course, you can do that in other ways too. We're just happy to have you along for the ride. Every story we have on this show is a bit different, but of course, there are similarities. And it's celebrating the similarities and the differences that has become a hallmark of this show. And it's one of my favorite things about what we do here. Week after week, we bring you guests that hopefully you can relate to, at least in part. And I hope again that They leave you with things to think about, things that make you better inside and outside of your training. And today's guest did a lot of that for me personally. Ms. Spahn is an author, a practitioner, and has a bit of a different path, one that you might not have expected to lead her where she ended up. Instead of ruining the story for you, I'll let her tell it. She does a much better job. So here we go. Ms. Spahn. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, hi, Jeremy. Thank you for having me on the show. Thanks for joining me on the show. This is, this is going to be fun. As I, I was just telling you, but now I'll tell the audience, you know, your name popped up as a listener suggestion. We love having the listeners put forth names of people to talk to because it means I get to talk to a variety of different people. And, and let's face it, it's a little more fun for me to reach out or, or less for somebody to reach out and say, hey, one of our listeners wants to have you on the show instead of, hi. I have a show. I want to talk to you on it. Just something about that comes through differently. Well, you know, I really appreciate the invitation and I really appreciate the listener. So listener, whoever you are out there, I don't have your name, but thank you very much personally for making the suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And we're going to talk about your journey and and there are a lot of maybe tangents that I suspect that we're going to go on some things a bit different in your martial journey than the average martial artist. And we'll get there, but before we get there, we got to start with some foundational stuff. So I'll ask you the question I've asked every single guest who's ever been on the show. How did you find martial arts? You know, martial arts actually found me. And I think that's probably the way that quite a few of us come into it. When I was a little kid, you know, I was a girl and I was growing up in the 1970s, ooh, which probably makes me old, but that's all right. And when I was growing up, you know, a lot of parents were telling their girls still to be girls. And my dad was very different. My dad put a bow and arrow in my hands when I was five years old and said, you know, don't shoot your brother. But other than that, have fun with this. And so the idea of studying martial arts, and I take a very expansive view of martial arts because a lot of my background is actually in history. But I started actually with bow and arrow was my way into martial arts. And then later, I developed an interest in taking uh, karate and um, taekwondo, hapkido, and studied those, you know, high school, college, I was a fencer. And then after college, I once again went back into taekwondo, hapkido, martial arts. And so basically, it's just been something that came to me when I was a kid, because my parents were interested in me pursuing what I wanted, rather than what somebody had a preconceived notion about, you know, what I ought to enjoy. And how did how did that path continue on? You know, what was it you found within martial arts that that resonated with you? Because not everybody sticks with it. Most people don't stick with it. So the people that do, they find something there. Well, I think it's really less, in some ways, the martial, or well, I suppose it is exactly the martial parts of the martial arts, because when I was nine years old, I discovered Japanese history. 
and I discovered originally through James Clavell, but then I started reading all kinds of history and history books. I was a little bit of a weird kid. I did a lot of reading. And the whole idea of Bushido and the idea of the code of the warrior, that there was a way to live your life that focused on martial arts, not just because you wanted to fight people and truly because you didn't want, not at all because you want to fight people, right? But because of the discipline and because of the ability to do things with your body that exhibit certain levels of control and skill and finesse. And that has always appealed to me, the idea that there is a beauty in motion and a beauty in the ability to harness the power that's within your body and to use it in a way that is simultaneously beautiful and violent has always held a lot of allure for me. And I, when I say violent, I want to be very clear. It's not to be able to like hurt people, but the fact that when you're practicing a martial art, right, whether it's kendo or whether it is any other swordsmanship discipline, fencing or hapkido, aikido, any of these martial arts, you are there is a necessary balance of violence and, and skill, and it's by its nature a fighting art, even if you never intend to use it to fight. And certainly that's an aspect of the conversation that comes up really often. You know, I, I won't say all the time, but that notion that whether or not you're using it for violent purposes, there is violence instilled in it. It has roots in violence, if nothing else. And it, it's a contrast that not everyone acknowledges and i think even more so there are people who actively disacknowledge it uh, avoid it i think that's true and i think there are also people a lot of people who misunderstand who think that if you're a person who enjoys martial arts if you're a person who enjoys whether that's swordsmanship or because for me swordsmanship is a large part of my martial arts journey and so if you if you're someone who appreciates learning how to use a sword you know there are a lot of people who can't imagine what you would use a sword for, except for violent purposes, when in reality, you know, the whole point of using a sword well is not to have to use it. So let's go back to, you said nine years old and you, you've discovered martial arts and now you've discovered Japanese history. Yes. And you're, you're, as you described, a weird kid. I, I can certainly <laughs> empathize with being a weird kid. And, and I think at nine, you, you, were, you were into Japanese history. I was into Greek mythology. That was kind of my big thing around that time. So I enjoyed what, that too. So we have that in common. Good, as well. good, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So I, I'm assuming that there, at least at that time, if if there were any, they there weren't too many Japanese history books for children. So you're probably reading some fairly comprehensive adult level books. I was, yeah. And what was it you were finding? I mean, you, you talked about Bushido and and your love for that code. One of the things I ask a lot of our guests, when they find martial arts and it, it really clicks for them, it seems like for nearly everyone, it's filling some kind of gap in their lives. As you found Japanese history and, and martial arts, are you aware of what place that was kind of filling up for you? You know, I wasn't at the time, but I am now. As an adult, I can look back and say, you know, I was a bullied kid. And I was never a kid who was going to get into a fight with somebody, but I was a kid who would retreat. And, but I felt very different. I never felt like I belonged. As I said, I was a weird kid, I had glasses, I did a lot of reading. Um, I, you know, I was doing sword play in the backyard with sticks, but not really, you know, <laughs> knowing what to do with it. And I think that what martial arts and Asian history did for me is that. I learned very early on about the Onnabugeisha, the women of the samurai class who were trained as warriors, wore the two swords, sometimes even dressed as men, although they, they weren't trying to be men, they were still women, but they were warriors and they were accepted as warriors. And this idea that these women were both a part of their society and separate from their society because they were so rare, that really resonated with me. It was this idea that you could be different and yet still have a place. And not just a place, but a place that was an honorable place. And so I really felt as though I was in the wrong time in some ways, although as an adult, I really prefer having flush toilets. So, you know, I'm not <laughs> sure that I would really want to go back to the 15th, 16th century. However, I really liked this idea that there was a time and a place when being different didn't 
necessarily make you have to be alone. And how did that understanding of history and that passion for that time and that together and separate, how did that guide your training? Well, um, when I studied, when I started studying martial arts, you know, I wasn't interested in just going to a, oh, let's take karate, let's take a, let's find a class that, you know, everybody goes to a commercial type of a studio. I really wanted to find a studio that was teaching, it was not going to do social promotion for belts, right? If you didn't deserve the next belt, you weren't going to get it no matter how long you studied. Because that way, when I got another belt, I knew that I'd earned that belt and I wasn't just being handed a belt because I'd been there six months and everybody who was six months was black belt, you know? Mm. And, you know, I mean, I studied for several years and managed a blue belt in, in Taekwondo and was about to test for my brown belt when I moved and ended up leaving the studio. But, you know, for me, it was important. I guess the right way of putting it was to do it for real instead of just doing it for something to do, to do it right, to find a, to find a very traditional master. I take a very traditional approach to these sorts of things. Um, when I studied archery, I didn't study with compound bows. I studied with an Osagi orange bow and a Mongolian double recurved horse bow, um, as well as a Japanese bow. So it's, you know, I've sought out more traditional forms, not because I think there's anything wrong with any form that is, you know, some, what's, what resonates with someone. I think that one beautiful thing about martial arts is that people can find the art that works for them and study it. But for me, it was about tradition. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm not sure how to ask this next question because I know a bit of the later points in the timeline. But at some point from your, your youthful interest in Japanese history and your training, we fast forward and listeners, I'm going to give some of this away. You're in Japan right now. You live there. I do. I live in Tokyo. Okay. Let's go back and tell me how that happened. Well, um, I graduated from college and went to law school because that was, I really wanted to get a PhD in Asia. My undergraduate degree, I should back up. My undergraduate degree is in uh, Chinese and Japanese history, language, and culture, and with a specialization in Japanese history and specifically the uh, Muromachi period, which is the period right before the Tokugawa shogunate began, which is the you know fifteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth century, sixteenth century, and then also in the Edo period, which is the seventeenth century and the Muromachi and the uh, Tokugawa shogunate. And so after I graduated, I really wanted to get a PhD, but I was concerned about being able to make a living because I wanted to be a novelist and I wanted to have a PhD and that neither of those really seemed like good, solid income earning, <laughs> you know, choices. So I went to law school, which my father had done, and my great grandfather had done, and it seemed like a safe thing to do. And I practiced law for almost 20 years. And in 2012, I did in fact have my first novel published and continued to practice law, wanted to break away from that, but didn't really know how. And then two years ago, I decided I was going to move to Japan, hopefully to break away from safe is the way I would describe it, and climb, try to climb 100 mountains in a year and figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And three months before I was due to leave for Japan, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I had to put my plans on hold. I had surgery, I had chemotherapy. And 14 days after finishing chemotherapy, I moved to Japan and I climbed those 100 mountains in 2018. And at the end of that 100 Summits journey, I realized that what I really wanted was to stay here and to dedicate my life to writing novels, climbing mountains, <laughs> studying martial arts, and studying Shodo, traditional Japanese calligraphy. And that's what I do now. What would nine-year-old you, as she's discovering these books and forming these ideas of what living in Japan is, because I assume at that point you hadn't traveled to Japan. No. What would she say about what you're doing now? You know, I really wish I could let her know, because 
she would have had a lot less angst along the way if she had known that it was all going to work out. And it sounded like there was some resolve in, in having cancer. I mean, just the way you talked about that, a lot of people will set up an anecdote, a story like that, and it becomes an emotional point in the conversation. This is one of those things that when, you know, after you've interviewed hundreds of people, you start to pick up on these little nuances. This is something that happens in my seat that listeners, you might not pick up on this stuff. But you kind of served it up for me. I, I felt the, the, the emotion building there, but it didn't go the, the direction that it, it typically goes. It wasn't, <laughs> and I got bre- breast cancer and I had to put my dream on hold for a little while and, and this and this. It was, and then 14 days later, I left. It well, sounded I mean, it was like, six months. <laughs> sure, sure. But obviously you couldn't leave in the midst of that, right? So, yes. but, but, but the way you described it was as soon as I could possibly leave. I mean, that's what I heard. I left. Then that, that, that's exactly the way it was. You know, when I looked at it, the first time I met with my oncologist, I said to him, you know, I can't believe this is happening. I mean, I, I, I have plans. I'm supposed to be leaving for Japan to climb 100 mountains. And, you know, I don't want this dream to die. And I was very lucky, incidentally. My cancer was found at stage 1B. So even though it was very aggressive, uh, I was not in my lymph system. And so I had four months of dose-dense chemotherapy. And as I said, surgery, fairly major surgery, and was able to leave. You know, I, I'm now getting ready to have my two-year post-cancer checkup and anticipate it being completely clear, as the last one was. But my oncologist said something very important, and I thought, you know, it resonated with me, and, and I held it very close. And what he said was, you don't have to stop your dream of climbing 100 mountains. It's just that now you have to climb 101, and the first one will be the hardest. Wow. <laughs> it sounds like the title of a book. I mean, that's, and, and I don't mean that facetiously, like that's, that's a perfect analogy. Well, ironically, it actually is the t- sort of the title of a book. Is it um, really? The book is called Climb, and it releases in 2020. Oh, it's oh cool. About, about the cancer journey and climbing the mountains and the way that life and the experience transformed me into having the courage to, you know, shuck off the anchor. You know, I basically I sold my house. My husband and I, we sold our house. We got rid of all of our belongings. We moved to Japan with no anchors back in the state. I mean, we have family there, but no anchors back in the States to, I was going to spend this year and we were going to figure out what was going to happen at the end of it. And the decision was to stay here and it all fell into place. But this has been where my heart has been calling me to for the last decade. And so I'm really, really, and probably longer than that, truthfully. So I'm very glad to be here. Now, typically on the show, I don't bring up people's spouses too often, but I think that, (laughs) I think that we have to here. (laughs) <laughs> because one does not sell everything, pick up, move to the other side of the world, and bring their spouse without either a, a tremendous amount of of fortune in that they have the same dream, or some kind of well, I'm not even going to speculate on the on the other side of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't mind. Sure. How did that all work? You know, my husband is a wonderful man. And he is also actually a martial artist. Um, he has studied uh, different kinds of martial arts for years and competed some when he was living in Florida. And he, has never be- he had never been to Japan, speaks no Japanese. And I literally went to him one day and said... <laughs> we have to move to Japan. This is what's in my heart. It's my dream. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, well, I'm going to climb these mountains and go do this. And he he just kind of looked at me like, and I mean, I think it took him all of a second and a half to say, okay, that's just the kind of person he is. You know, he's, he's always been very, very supportive of the dream and he's an artist himself. And so he, a graphic artist. And so for him, it was not as difficult. He, he had been a video game. He had worked in the video game industry as a play tester and things like that. And then he was a stay-at-home dad while our son was in school. And our son had actually graduated from college and moved to Japan. <laughs> Sometimes the acorn doesn't fall away from the tree at all. 
And so he was living in Japan. And so basically he's our only child. And so when I said, I've got to do this, he said, well, you know, keep the family together. Let's do it. So here we are with our cat in Tokyo. We're, we're going to pull this back and, and talk more about you and, and, and your journey in books and martial arts in a moment. But I, I want to kind of wrap up this circle a little bit. And what's it been like for your family? What's it been like to, to move there? How close are you to your son and all the other kind of logistical family things that the listeners are, are listening, thinking, uh, my family? Well, you know, it was really interesting because when we first arrived, I had applied for a journalism visa because I had <laughs> signed a book contract to write this book, Climb, about this decision to break free from safe and climb a hundred mountains and try and find the courage to pursue my dreams when I had been afraid of everything my whole life, a week before I got the cancer diagnosis. So when I arrived in Japan, they had refused my journalism visa because apparently writing a book does not make you a journalist. True story. <laughs> Which we found out seven days before we moved. So when we arrived, I was on a cultural activities visa, which long way around Robin Hood's barn to say that makes it very difficult to rent an apartment. The realtor told me that she could only find one apartment in South Tokyo that would rent a quote unquote unemployed, because I was a writer, which apparently is unemployed, not too far from the truth, and a uh, foreigner with a husband and a cat, which also is difficult. Um, and so she said, do you want to see it? And I said, yes. And we were driving down the street to the apartment and I recognized the 7-Eleven on the corner and said, I know that 7-Eleven. We are about 300 yards from my son's apartment. <laughs> wow. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to guess that at that moment you recognize the 7-Eleven, you, something in your head said, this is going to work. Yeah, I knew it was. And the apartment was beautiful and they let us in seven days later, which was seven days before I went to the far north to Hokkaido to climb some very large mountains and live volcanoes. So it all worked out. You know, the timing of this past year has been one long series of fortuitous events or non-coincidences, depending on which way your belief system runs. But it has been a pretty amazing year. And it's wonderful to have, you know, my family here together and just to be able to have landed on landed on my feet, which I suppose is what all good martial artists try to do, right? You know, you, you go for the backflip and you really hope that you don't land on your nose. Right. Right. I mean, we might might make some comments about the uh, the BJJ community and, and their desire to be on their back, but it's <laughs> still about where you're comfortable, whether it, whether it's literal feet or figurative feet. This is true. Finding this that, is true. That, that place this where is you true. feel Control strong. the mat, let's put it that it, way, exactly. instead of letting the mat control you. Yes. Yeah. Now, what was that, that first hike like? It was hilarious, to be totally honest with you. I had, bear in mind, I said I was going to climb 100 mountains. You're talking to somebody who had climbed exactly one mountain in her life, and it, was almost, it almost killed me. <laughs> so whatever possessed me that I could climb 100 of them, including Mount Fuji, incidentally, I mean, it was, it was, it was absolutely bizarre that this came to me as something that I needed to do. Uh, it was a vision quest. And amazingly, on the far side of it, I'm now a mountain climber, which is great. But that first mountain, I just didn't, I literally went out to it with this attitude of like, I'll climb up till I can't go up anymore. And that's kind of what I'll do. And it took me all of five minutes to realize that mountain climbing is difficult. <laughs> and it's more trekking, bear in mind, the mountains in Japan are not... Everest-sized mountains. Mount Fuji is the highest. It's 3,776 meters. We're not talking, you know, people, my friends who live in Colorado kind of laugh at me and they're like, yeah, haha, you climbed, we'll call them mountains for your sake. But it is a reality that when you haven't climbed one at all, any mountain is big. And I don't want to give away anything from the book, but did you climb 100? I did. I climbed 100 mountains and I did it within 370 days of finishing chemotherapy. Now that, I imagine, transition mentally from, as you said, f a few minutes in, climbing the first mountain and thinking, hey, this is really hard, and I suspect some doubt came in, probably some <laughs> judgment. <laughs> Indeed. Because I'm, I'm imagining myself being there saying, I moved here to do this, and this is very hard. 
and I don't know that I want to do this anymore, but how do I extricate myself? You, you didn't, you just kept going. There were what moments like? when I would ask myself, there were moments when I would ask myself, why didn't you decide to eat a hundred ice cream sundaes or <laughs> bathe in a hundred onsen or see a hundred waterfalls or do one of a hundred other things that would not have involved hours and hours and hours of sweaty, hot physical labor. But having committed, you know, one thing martial arts did teach me is that everyone pretty much sucks at everything to begin with, right? No matter which yeah. martial art you pick up, you will be bad for a long time until you're not bad anymore. Mountains are the point. same. Do you think if you hadn't committed to writing this book before you started, you might have been less likely to finish? No. Okay. Because the decision to climb the hundred mountains wasn't done for the book. The book came later. Oh, okay. I decided that for some reason I had it in my head that the way I was going to face my fears and get over the fact that I was afraid of everything and too tied to a safe career that I found unfulfilling in many ways and to a life that I found unfulfilling in many ways. And for some reason, I just it just came to me and I just knew that if I came to Japan and climbed a hundred mountains in a year, I would be transformed. And so having made that personal commitment, I was not going to fail. Tell us about that last mountain. The last mountain was really interesting because I did it three times. Hmm. Um, meaning I climbed three different mountains. I had a friend who came from the States. Most of my climbs I did solo. I climbed Fuji. My 75-year-old mother came from the States, climbed Mount Fuji with me and a couple of uh, family friends. But then the last mountain, I went and climbed a series of mountains in places that were very important to me. I climbed Mount Inari in Kyoto, which is the site of Fushimi Inari Taisha, which is a shrine that's famous for the 10,000 red Tori gates that line the slope. Many people have probably seen photos of it. And I, mean, I have pictures of it on my Facebook and my blog. If people haven't seen it, it's very impressive. And I love it, but I had climbed it in July. So I couldn't count it. But I climbed it again with my, with my friend who came. And then the next day, we went down to Nara, which is where a lot of the elements of what we know as Japanese culture began. And I climbed a sacred mountain in Nara City. And that was actually technically mountain number 100, but it's very small. It's only about 300 meters. So it's not much of a mountain. So then the next day we went to Koyasan, which is one of the most sacred mountains in all of Japan. And it is where Kobo Daishi, who's also known as Kukai, who was known, he was a priest who brought esoteric Buddhism back to Japan from China during the eighth century and is also credited with creating the kana syllabary that's used to write Japanese phonetically. He established his center of meditation and learning on Koyasan, which is a mountain high altitude valley ringed with peaks. And I climbed Manisan, which is one of the three sacred mountains of Koyasan, the Koyasan Sanzan. And that was the third hundred summit. And by create, doing them in three with a mountain I had climbed before and loved, and a mountain that was very sacred to Japan's origins. And then I have personal connections to Koyasan that are very special to me. It basically brought the whole journey full circle and let me complete it in a way that felt truly complete. You talked about wanting to tackle this because of fear. You were looking to overcome fear. And, and I think the words you used were, you know, you were afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. Did that happen? You know, it did. It did. I, I actually had a moment when I was in Hokkaido, about two thirds of the way up the peaks, when I was about, about, about halfway finished, actually. And I, uh, one night I was getting ready to climb the mountain. I know this is going to sound really weird and woo-woo, but, you know, <laughs> truth is woo-woo more than fiction, I guess, sometimes. And I had had recurrent nightmares my whole life. And in that night, as I was getting ready to climb this mountain, where we climbed up the side of the waterfall the next day, and we were sleeping in a mountain hut, and I had a dream 
one of my old nightmares where I used to argue with someone from my past all the time. And instead of arguing, this person from my past basically was extended an olive branch. And I write more in the book about the extent of the dream. But when I woke up, instead of having fought with this person, I had made peace. And I realized when I woke up that it wasn't about ever, the nightmares were never about this person from my past. It, that was just the face my own subconscious chose to wear. And that my whole life, I had not accepted myself. And that finally happened. And after that happened, I was able to work through fear and come to a place of confidence. Yeah. And so, pretty, yeah, it did happen. It's pretty powerful. And how has all of this affected your training? You know, this is a, a martial arts show. And, and, and as much as, you know, we're, we're wandering around, I'm curious because you've got these distinct points of time. I mean, hard lines, childhood and being sick and being in Japan and then being in Japan on the other side of fear. And I'm sure we could find and draw plenty of other lines. But how has all of this, and, and maybe we work from now backwards, how has this affected your training? Well, you know, I had gone through a period, I've always practiced one martial art or another throughout the his my history. And as I got older, once I had graduated from law school and I was studying Taekwondo and Hapkido, and then I had to move and so I had to leave my dojo, which was very sad for me. And then I picked up archery again and was really studying archery for a while. I studied, <laughs> studied knife throwing for a while, um, knife and tomahawk, and did that for a while. And then we moved to Japan and I had to get rid of my sword and I had to get rid of my, which I had practiced with, and I had to get rid of my bows. And so when I came, you know, I was getting sick I and mean, you can't really do a lot of that when you're in chemo anyway. And then when I came to Japan, I have wanted for a long time to study kendo here with a master, but I didn't have time while I was climbing. I told myself, you know, you, you can only do so many things if you're climbing for a year. Because <laughs> if you do the math, 100 mountains in 365 days doesn't leave a whole lot of extra time. No, no, especially if uh, recovery is, is part of the process. Well, and, uh, you know, I climbed on, I climbed in on all four of Japan's major islands. I climbed in more than half of the prefectures and I climbed in all but one of the major regions of Japan over that year. So I've seen a lot of this country in the last year and it's wonderful. Yeah. But I did find time to start studying Shodo or traditional Japanese calligraphy with a master here. And I found that the level of peace and meditation that is involved in Shodo, I've truly come to an understanding now. You know, as a historian, I knew that calligraphy was considered one of, actually considered one of the martial arts by a lot of the samurai during the medieval para, period. It was considered to be a show, a sign of culture and refinement, very similar to being a good swordsman. Hmm. And it's only now that I have been studying with a very respected sensei and she is actually one of the senior students of a man who's a national living treasure calligrapher that i have come to understand why why it makes sense because she talks about the power in the strokes but the power in the stroke is not just making a bold dark black line sometimes power involves making the thinnest of thin lines using only one hair from the tip of the brush, but not allowing that line to wobble, not allowing that line to be weak. And it's the same kind of focused power that you need when you're focusing key to break a board or when you are performing a kata at the high end and you need every move to be perfect. It's about fluidity. It's about grace. It's about strength and control. And it's about being able to harness rather than subordinate what comes from within you. And so I would say that, and also the other thing that I pulled from these hundred summits was the level of perseverance that martial arts taught me. You know, martial arts teaches you that if you try something and you can't do it the first time, you know, I remember when I was first learning to break boards in Taekwondo. 
And man, did I bruise my wrist. I meant my hand, my wrist. It was purple, you know, because I, I was doing it wrong. But my sensei wouldn't let me stop. I mean, he obviously I was able to stop at the end of class. He didn't want me to actually hurt myself. I'll give that little disclaimer before anybody goes, gets freaking out and saying he was a bad man, right? <laughs> but, but he kept saying, you can do this. You can do this. You, just, you have to focus. You have to focus. You can do this. You just need to keep trying. And I wanted to just give up. I wanted to just say, you know what? I, it, I don't need the new belt. It's fine. I, don't, I, I can't do this part. I'll just go back to katas. And he was like, you can't just go back to katas. You have to do this. Because you can do this. And I remembered that when I was in the mountains. And it was part of what got me through. This idea that it's not about, it's hard now, so I'm going to stop. You can do this. So execute it. There are a lot of lessons in there. It was a year full of lessons. Yeah. It's a pretty powerful year. Uh, yeah. Well, it was also embarrassing sorts of lessons like don't eat raisins on a mountaintop when there's not. A <laughs> I, I'm, I'm laughing because I know because <laughs> I, I've made mistakes such as these. Yeah. Dried fruit packs really well in your backpack. It does. It packs less and, well in your stomach. And uh, yeah, yeah. The, the benefit, the extent of the benefits ends there. Uh, it is dark magic indeed when that happens, <laughs> isn't it? I want to go back to the calligraphy. Because yes. I, don't, I don't think we've had anyone else on the show who's talked about calligraphy. And, and if they have, it's been much more surface in the way that you're presenting it. So I, I want to revisit this idea, and, and this, is, this is not critical, um, sure. but because I don't have the understanding of calligraphy, to put it in a similar basket as karate or, or other traditional martial arts is very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you, know, you, you talked about the brushstrokes, you talked about that, but I'm wondering if you might go a bit deeper and help I help the listeners understand a bit more about those similarities and why they were considered similar or together? Well, um, traditional calligraphy is not just about being able to write a kanji, right? I can write a kanji, you can write a kanji, anybody who can copy something can write a kanji. But the essence of calligraphy is actually about Writing the strokes, there are certain recognized masters, many of whom have been considered masters since the 5th, 6th century Chinese masters of calligraphy, which is where Japan got its calligraphy. It all was imported over from China. And similarly to studying martial arts, right, the way you learn a martial art is you practice a form. You learn how to throw a punch. You learn the form for a punch. Anybody can throw a punch, but can anybody throw a punch the way a black belt throws a punch? Of course not. The black belt knows a lot about harnessing ki and about the actual, not just the form of the punch, right? But if you give a black belt, you know, a spot on the wall, a little tiny one, you say, hit that spot every time, the same way with your third knuckle, every single time, he's going to be able to do that. Or she's going to be able to do that because they have the control that when they do a kata, it looks exactly the same the 50,000th time they do the kata as the you know, 55,000th time they do the kata, whatever it is. Because part of the beauty in the martial art is performing the form in an archetypal way, right? This idea that you are pursuing not just your own style, although at some point development of a style is appropriate, but when you're first learning, what you learn is to copy. And you learn to duplicate what you've been shown and you repeat it over and over and over and over until it's perfect. It's what belt testing is. You have to demonstrate that you can perform those skills the right way. And as it happens, traditional calligraphy also has a testing system and it is also ranked Q and Don, just like martial arts are. And over the past year, in October of last year, my sensei said that I was ready to start testing. And as of today, I am 10th Don, which is the, actually the lowest ranked. First Don is the best and 10th Don is the worst. But I am a 10th Don kanji calligrapher. And I am third Q 
or fourth Q, sorry, testing for third Q in Kana, in the ancient Kana stocks. Mm. And the way that the progression is very similar. You study a form and then you test in that form. And if you pass in the test in that form, you're advanced and you learn a more advanced form. And so there are a lot of similarities in the way that rank is established, in the way that titles are established. You know, one of the things that you had mentioned is that a lot, you know, a lot of your guests have a title in martial arts. Eventually, I will obtain a title in calligraphy as well. Um, what it is, I do not know. Um, I was given a calligraphy name, which is something that you're not given until you reach a certain level of progression. And so I have a calligraphy name now. And it was, you know, bestowed on me by my sensei. And so a lot of the parallels have to do with both the way that it's learned and the idea that just as martial arts are not just about the physical act of throwing a punch or kicking, right, or performing any form, anyone who could learn the motion could do the form, could do the kata. But would they actually be performing the kata the same way that a black belt who's harnessing key to do it would perform it? Absolutely not. It's a totally different experience. It's like the difference in looking at a painting of a bird and looking at a bird. One of them is infused with life and the other is just a copy. And calligraphy is very similar. I could hand you a brush and I could show you a form and you could write it. And maybe you would even make a passable imitation of what was on the paper, right? But there's a life to calligraphy that's been written by somebody who knows how to harness that interior energy. One last story, and I know I've been talking a long time, but... No, oh, but please keep talking. It makes my job easy. <laughs> <laughs> my sensei recently asked me to participate in an exhibition in January at the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Art, Ueno which is a big honor for somebody at my level. And she wanted me to write Koyagire, which is a section of the old Kokin Wakashu, which is 14th century, one of the oldest collections of Japanese poetry. And I'm writing based on the old manuscript, and I'm, basically what you're doing is copying the manuscript. And I produced what I thought was, you know, I mean, a reasonably not terrible version for someone at my level. And I took it in for Tenzaku for corrections. And she looked at it. And she was looking at the pages and she paged through and she pointed to a line and she said, I see that you were hesitant and sad. Why does your calligraphy look sad? And I looked at it and I thought, does it look sad? I mean, the truth was I was sad that day. I was sad because this calligraphy was so beautiful and I wasn't doing a good job of copying. And she saw that in the lines. And I went home and spent an hour looking at those pages until I too could recognize why it was that they looked sad. And I had known that calligraphy conveyed because I knew that when I was practicing martial arts, when I went to Taekwondo, if I was angry or frustrated or sad, my performance was off. You can't harness prop that, that key properly. You cannot produce the beautiful art, the fluidity of movement, when your brain is somewhere else. And it's not that you have to be focused, because, of course, just like martial arts, the best mind to have for calligraphy is no mind. The more you think, the worse you do. That's some pretty strong stuff right there. Um, I'll confess, I just got a little, a uh, little emotional listening to that, <laughs> put, put a few things that I'm going through in, into perspective. So I appreciate that on a personal level. Well, glad to help. That's yeah, part of, thanks. It's, it's part of why I climbed the hundred summits. One of the things that mm. I really hope in writing the book, one of the things I'm hoping is that I can inspire people to understand that you don't know what cards you're dealt. You can only play the cards that are in your hand, but you better play them to the best of your ability. Has your calligraphy experience and, and, you know, like that story you just told us, has that had an influence on your martial arts? 
Well, absolutely. It's made me absolutely determined that I'm going to find a kendo uh, studio and I'm going to get back into active practice as soon as, as soon as possible, which for me means as soon as I get my next mystery to the publisher in December. <laughs> mm. Everything we've talked about today has been looking back or looking at today. Let's look into the future. What do you see for you, for your time in Japan, for your family, for your training, for, for any of the above and anything else I haven't mentioned? Well, I'm going to continue writing my books. You know, they're, I write mysteries in addition to this book that was the nonfiction book. I write mysteries that are set in 16th century Japan, a ninja detective, um, who's not one of the Superman from the movies, but an actual historical shinobi um, partnered up with a Jesuit priest. And so I do a lot of traveling and a lot of research into historical martial arts for those books. And so I want to keep writing those books, keep researching, because I love the fact that I get to travel, I get to talk with people who are practitioners of old martial arts. So not just modern versions, but people who are still legitimately trying to practice older arts, uh, try to find a living ninja. That's, that's, that's a challenge. But, you know, finding people who understand about the weaponry, who understand about the way it was used the espionage, the things that were going on. That's really, really great and interesting stuff. Um, I hope to find a, as I said, a kendo studio. I would like to also start practicing maybe some traditional Japanese archery here with the master. If I can find somebody, which is not that difficult. You see people with bows walking around periodically on the subway, which is always interesting. <laughs> and uh, I want to continue practicing calligraphy. That's an art that I will never give up because it gives me great peace. You know, it's a wonderful thing to look up and realize three hours have passed and you have not worried about a thing because you've not thought about it. You've just been focused on the lines and the power of the lines and the beauty of the traditional poetry that you're writing because, you know, I write all Japanese poetry in calligraphy. It's not, you know, it's the old stuff. Mm. And continuing to improve my Japanese, which is still pretty terrible, but better than it used to be. You know, I'm, I'm great if you show me a 14th century manuscript, but you ask me to read a shopping list and I'm pretty much hooked. <laughs> so, <laughs> the differences in vocabulary. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And so that's basically it. You know, martial arts, maybe even study with my husband. That's something we've never done before. Study martial arts at the same time together. Uh, we decided early on that it was probably not a good idea to spar with each other, just on principle. But, you know, we're older now, and maybe he can handle me knocking him down. <laughs> I can't handle Statistically, him Statistically, I would agree, just based on what I've seen. Uh, yeah, he's, he, he would actually have always been good with me knocking him down. I would have been less good with losing. So, you know, I'm, mm. he was probably being nice to me and saying that. But, but anyway, it's, you know, that's... The future holds wonderful things. I mean, for me, every day, and I know a lot of people say this, but every day really is a blessing. I mean, I was told in November of 2017 that if I had waited another week to get my mammogram, it was possible that I could have been stage two. And if I had waited another six weeks, it would have been stage three. That's so, yeah, it was very aggressive. It was the highest possible aggressiveness rating for, for a breast cancer that there is. Mm. And, you know, so for me, I really do feel like I was reborn in November. I actually celebrate my birthday in, really in November more than I do in July now, because that's when, that's when my life started over. And so for me, what does the future hold? I can't tell you what it holds a year from now or 10 years from now, or even if I have 10 years from now, but I can tell you that tomorrow, it holds calligraphy and it holds walking. And I can tell you that this Saturday and Sunday and Monday, it holds a 30 kilometer through hike to the mountains north of Tokyo. Wow. And so to the extent that I have the time, the future holds martial arts, it holds calligraphy, it holds nature, and it holds everything I can pack into the time that I have. Sounds wonderful. Sounds great. <laughs> now, if people want to find you, your books, social media, websites, any of that stuff, where would they go? Uh, the easiest. Well, my website is susanspan.com. It's S as in Sam, P as in Peter, A, N as in Nancy, N as in Nancy, like bridge with second N on the end. 
at susanspan.com on Facebook. It's Susan Span Author. I post a lot of pictures on Facebook. My blog has not been as active for the last couple months because I was finishing a manuscript, but it will be picking up again. And I post, again, a lot of pictures from Japan, everything from mountains to weird cultural things to some of the best looking desserts you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> And martial arts related things. I travel to a lot of sites um, to the, you know, to the ninja village in Iga Ueno and all kinds of things. So I have pictures from that and swords from the museums and all kinds of fun things that, that I run into over here. And then I also have an Instagram, which is uh, at susanspan.author. And again, on Facebook, it's slash susanspanauthor. Cool. Cool. And of course, we'll link all those on the show notes. Wonderful. Everyone. Thank you very much. Of course, of course. And one final thing as we head out, what parting words would you give to the people listening today? Parting words I would give you is do it today. Whatever it is that you want to do, that you keep telling yourself, you know, I'll find a way to do that happen next year, next month, when I can, when I have the money, when I have the time. You will never have the time to do anything. You have to make it. So whatever your dream is, don't say I'll do it when I can, and especially don't say it, I'll do it when I retire. Find a way to make it happen now. I had a great time with today's episode, and I learned a lot, not just about the guests, but about myself. There's some good stuff to unpack, and I think I'm going to be referring back to today's conversation quite a bit. So thank you for coming on the show, and I look forward to next year's book, and I appreciate you being so open. If you want to check out the show notes, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got photos, we've got links, we've got transcripts. You can sign up for the newsletter, and you can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. If you use the code PODCAST15 at whistlekick.com, you'll save 15% on everything we've got going on over there. And if you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, that'll get to me directly. Thank you so much for your time, for your support. Until next time. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.